Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Previously on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. You're listening to episode 40 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. In this episode, we're talking about Fatima. In 1917, three small children from Fatima, Portugal, reported that the Virgin Mary had begun appearing to them. She appeared every month on the 13th of the month. In July of 1917, she told the children a three-part secret. We won't be able to cover everything. There's just too much detail. We're unfortunately not going to be able to talk about the third part of the secret. So what we're going to do since October is the anniversary of Our Lady's last appearance at Fatima, we're going to talk in October about the third secret secret and all of the theories connected with that. You're listening to episode 64 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the third secret of Fatima. I'm Dom Bettinelli. And joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1917, the Virgin Mary appeared to three small children from Fatima, Portugal. She revealed to them a three-part secret. The first two parts were soon revealed, but the third part remained secret. Speculation about it ran wild. Hope grew in 1960 when people thought it might be released, but the Pope at the time, John XXIII, didn't make it public. Speculation continued and grew even more fervent, but it seemed like the secret might never be released, and that all changed in the year 2000 when John Paul II finally made public the third part of the secret, and that's what we'll be talking about today on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So let's start with some background. Jimmy, uh, what can you tell us about the Fatima apparitions? For the full background, you want to go back and listen to episode 40 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we talked about the apparition as a whole. But here's a quick recap. In 1917, three small children from Fatima, Portugal, reported that the Virgin Mary had begun appearing to them, and she appeared every month on the 13th of the month. In July of that year, she told the children a three-part secret, which they were not allowed to disclose at first. She also promised to perform a great miracle at her October appearance, and on October 13th, thousands of people gathered and saw the sun do strange things in the sky, an event now called the Miracle of the Sun. In the 1920s, one of the children, now an adult named Sister Lucia, revealed that the Virgin Mary had asked the Pope and the bishops of the world to consecrate Russia to her. In the 1940s, she wrote down the three-part secret, but the third part was not made public. Eventually, the first and second parts of the secret, though, were revealed. And what were those first two parts? Well, as early as 1917, the children had said that Mary told them a secret, but they didn't say what it was. Sister Lucia then wrote a series of memoirs at like the request of her bishop and so forth about what had happened in the apparition. And in her third memoir, written in 1941, Lucia revealed the first two parts of the secret. The first part was a vision of hell and the souls that go there. The second part, though, was more complex. Mary said, You have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. The war is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. When you see a night illumined by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given to you by God that he is about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war famine, and persecutions of the Church and of the Holy Father. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the Church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, various nations will be annihilated, In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she will be converted, 
and a period of peace will be granted to the world. So the second part of the secret thus predicted that World War I, which was going on at the time, would end, but that if people didn't repent, World War II would begin in the reign of Pius XI. Uh, he was elected in 1922 after Benedict XV passed on, and the sign presaging the new war was to be a night illumined by an unknown light. Well, on the night of January 25th into 26th in 1938, in the reign of Pius XI, an extraordinary display of the Aurora Borealis was widely visible in Europe. It occurred shortly before Hitler annexed Austria to Germany. In her third memoir, Sister Lucia interpreted this event as the sign indicating that the new war was close, though personally she suspected it wasn't actually the Aurora Borealis. She thought it was more a direct miracle that people thought was the Aurora. However that may be, World War II broke out the following year, although some argue it began even earlier because wars often have rolling starts as one event leads into another. And we'll actually have a link in the uh, further resources to an article arguing that. We should note uh, that in her fourth memoir, written in 1941, so this is the one after she first revealed the first two parts, in her fourth memoir, Sister Lucia added a little bit at the end of the second part of the secret, writing, In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc. Do not tell this to anybody. Francisco, yes, you may tell him. Yeah, and this addition played a role in the later controversy over the secret, so keep it in mind. So why didn't Lu Sister Lucia write the third part of the secret? She didn't feel she had permission from heaven to do so at the time. But in 1943, she got really ill, and the bishop suggested she write down the third part of the secret in case she died. She hesitated to do so because she hadn't been given an, an instruction by Mary but she felt torn because as a Carmelite nun, she had vowed obedience to her superiors. To end the quandary, the bishop gave her an order to write it down, and she did so in 1944. She placed it in a sealed envelope and wrote that it could be opened only after 1960, either by the Patriarch of Lisbon, Portugal, or by the Bishop of Leiria. She then gave it to the Bishop of Leiria, Fatima, and in 1957, the envelope was transferred to the Holy See. And so then what happened when 1960 came? It had become known that Sister Lucia had indicated that the secret could be read in 1960, so there was intense speculation about what it said, and many people expected its contents to be announced. The Pope at the time, as you said, was John XXIII, and in preparation for 1960, he asked to read the secret and he received the envelope containing it on August 17, 1959. In his diary, he said he intended to read it with his confessor. Ultimately, he decided not to publish it, and he returned it to the archives. And, of course, this caused a huge controversy. One consequence was that many people thought that the third secret must contain something truly shocking and apocalyptic, something that the Vatican didn't want the public to know because they were afraid of what it would mean. Another consequence was that various people began accusing the Vatican of a cover-up. Some even accused the Vatican of defying Our Lady's order to make the secret known in 1960. And these claims continued to be made for the next 40 years. So was the Vatican defying Our Lady's orders? Not according to Sister Lucia. In the year 2000, the Vatican released a document called The Message of Fatima that dealt with the apparition and the third secret. And it records that when the secret was finally revealed, Archbishop Tarsicio Bertone had a conference with Sister Lucia, and he said, Why only after 1960? Was it Our Lady who fixed that date? And Sister Lucia replied, it was not Our Lady. I fixed the date because I had the intuition that before 1960 it would not be understood, but that only later would it be understood. So Mary had not ordered that the secret be revealed at all, much less in 1960. Uh, Sister Lucia simply had an intuition that it would be better understood then, and so she wrote not to open it before then. 
but don't open before 1960 is not the same thing as you must publish in 1960. Also note that this is an example, Sister Lucia's intuition is an example of a human element in an apparition. And so we shouldn't treat all these things as if they're dictated word for word by God. Sister Lucia wasn't willing to say God required this. It was just her intuition. One of the key differences between private and public revelation, right? We Yeah. We talked about that before. Okay. So so who next read this third secret? Pope Paul VI in 1965, he read it and he also decided not to publish it and then returned it to the archives. Okay. So after Paul VI was uh, John Paul I. Did he read it? No, he was in office for only a month, and the archives don't indicate that he asked to see it at that time. So that takes us up to the reign of his successor, John Paul II. And what were people saying about the secret at that time? Some people were still accusing the Vatican of a cover-up and of defying Our Lady's order to publish the secret in 1960. They were inferring from the non-publication that it must contain something apocalyptic in nature. Some speculated that it must contain prophecies about the end of the world. Others noting that the second part of the secret referred to Russia spreading her errors throughout the world, causing wars and saying that various nations will be annihilated, inferred that it contained a prediction of a nuclear war. And that's something that could be tied in with the idea it dealt with the end of the world. Some took her 1941 edition at the end of the second part of the secret, where she said in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc. Not some of them took that not as a part of this of the second part of the secret, but they took it as the beginning of the third part of the secret. It's like she decided slyly to reveal the first sentence of the third part in the 1941 memoir. That was the idea. And they therefore reasoned that, well, if it says the dogma of the faith is going to be preserved in Portugal, that must imply a worldwide apostasy that will affect maybe everywhere but Portugal. So they said the third secret, you know, not only may have to do with nuclear war, but an apostasy from the faith. Since the second part of the secret also said that Russia would spread her errors and cause persecutions of the church, some inferred that Russian agents would infiltrate the church and spread false doctrine, causing the apostasy. This also could be tied in with the idea that the third part of the secret would deal with the end of the world, since scripture predicts there will be an apostasy before the end. And some accused the Second Vatican Council that met between 1962 and 1965 as being part of this Russia-induced apostasy. They also argued that it was urgent for the Pope to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart, and they continued to demand that the Pope release the Third Secret. In fact, on May 2nd, 1981, a former Trappist monk from Australia named Lawrence James Downey hijacked an Aer Lingus flight from Dublin to Heathrow Airport. He went into the bathroom and doused himself in gasoline, then got into the cockpit and demanded that the plane be diverted from France and then travel to Tehran. In France, he demanded that the press publish a manifesto in which he further demanded that John Paul II release the third secret. So you've got this crazed former monk <laughs> hijacking a plane and <laughs> demanding the Pope release the third secret. Wow. The French special forces ultimately rushed the plane and took him into custody. And fortunately, nobody was hurt. Back in the day, airline hijackings were much more common than, than they are today. Back in the 70s, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and today, after 9-11, people take them way more seriously. Yeah. You, you do not try this. You will be tackled. Well, you won't even make it onto the plane, uh, frankly. Yeah. So had he made this demand, had Pope John Paul II even read The Secret at this point? Surprisingly, no. I mean, he was a very Marian pope. He had a, a strong personal devotion to Mary, including uh, various Marian apparitions like Our Lady of Yasnogora from Poland. But he had not. According to the archives, he hadn't read the secret yet. But on May 13th, so this is 11 days after the hijacking attempt on the Aer Lingus flight, uh, on May 13th, 1981, Mehmet Ali Aja shot him in St. Peter's Square. 
This is the famous assassination attempt on John Paul II. The bullet almost killed him. And while he was recovering in the hospital, he got to thinking about Fatima and the request to have Russia consecrated to her Immaculate Heart. He then composed an act of entrustment, which he had read in his absence at St. Mary Major. That's a basilica in Rome, a big one, really beautiful, too, on June 7th while he was recuperating. He also noticed that the day on which he was shot, May 13th, was the anniversary of the first apparition in 1917. In his 1994 book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, he wrote, And thus we come to May 13, 1981, when I was wounded by gunshots fired in St. Peter's Square. At first, I did not pay attention to the fact that the assassination attempt had occurred on the exact anniversary of the day Mary appeared to the three children at Fatima in Portugal and spoke to them the words that now, at the end of the century, seemed to be close to their fulfillment. He then asked to read the secret, and it was brought to him on July 18th, and he returned it to the archives on August 11th. The archives, by the way, are in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. That's where it was being housed. The next year, on the anniversary of the assassination attempt and of the first appearance of Our Lady of Fatima, so on May 13th, 1982, he went to Fatima to pray in Thanksgiving and to renew the act of entrustment. He attributed his survival to Our Lady of Fatima. He donated the bullet, or a bullet, recovered from the Pope Mobile, uh, which at the time was not glass encased. It, it didn't have that bulletproof glass over it. It was just an open car, and it was this event that caused them to put the bulletproof glass over it. But uh, they'd found a bullet in the Pope Mobile, and he donated it to the local bishop, who then placed it in the crown of the official image of Mary in the shrine at Fatima. Yet more craziness, the day before this event, a crazed Spaniard, a former priest, so not a former monk this time, but a former priest, broke through the security line at Mass and stabbed the Pope with a bayonet. I don't remember that attempt. Uh, how badly mm -hmm. was he hurt? Do you remember? It wasn't nearly as badly as the assassination. That's yeah. a that was that's what that's a new one to me. Uh, okay, so by this time, John Paul II had already performed the act of entrustment twice. W was this enough? Well, actually, prior popes had done similar things. In October of 1942, for the 25th anniversary of Fatima, Pius XII consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and the next year, Sister Lucia wrote a letter in which she said, "Quote." The war will soon end on account of the action that His Holiness deigned to perform, but since it was incomplete, the conversion of Russia has been put off to later, close quote. Hmm. So she's saying he made a an act of entrustment that did some good and helped speed the end of World War II, otherwise it would have gone on longer, but because he hadn't done everything that had been requested with the um, act of consecration, Russia wasn't going to be converted yet. So you can just imagine how the Cold War would wow. have been different if he had done the whole thing. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> In 1952, Pius XII again did a consecration. This time he consecrated the Russian people to the Immaculate Heart. In 1964, Paul VI renewed the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart. And John Paul II then did the entrustment in 1981 and again in 1982. But these weren't considered sufficient by Sister Lucia. The sticking point was that the popes had been doing the consecrations on their own or with only some of the world's bishops, because the request was the pope and the bishops of the world. Not necessarily every single one of them, but, you know, Enough to represent uh, enough. the world. Yeah. yeah. Therefore, John Paul II earnestly requested that the bishops of the world join him in making a new act of consecration on March 24th, 1984. In this act, he said, quote, in a special way, we entrust and consecrate to you those individuals and nations which particularly need to be thus entrusted and consecrated, close quote. So why didn't he mention Russia by name, why those individuals and Russia, which needs? Yeah, so he, he just said nations instead of Russia. Yeah. And this was because, you know, it was the height of the Cold War. At the time, the Soviet leader was Konstantin Chernyenko, and he was only in office for 13 months, and he was terminally ill, and it was really sh a shaky situation. 
there was a, there is a nuclear war scare that we're going to talk about. Also, John Paul II is a Polish pope, and Poland was part of the Warsaw Pact that was under Russia's thumb. And Russia had almost invaded Poland in 1981. So he was he's in a delicate situation as this Eastern Bloc Pope, and he's not wanting to inflame Cold War tensions with these crazy paranoid Soviet leaders. And they already viewed him as trying to take them down, which, frankly, he was. <laughs> but he didn't want to publicly provoke them further by naming Russia specifically. So even though everyone knew who he was talking about, he said nations and instead of Russia. So then was this 1984 entrustment successful? According to Sister Lucia, yes. In 1989, she wrote a letter in which she said, quote, Yes, it has been done just as Our Lady asked on March 25th, 1984, close quote. So she said, yes, it's done. However, this didn't satisfy some people who argued that the consecration had not been done. Some of them claimed that Sister Lucia was being forced to say these things, or even that she hadn't said them at all. Some said she had been replaced by an imposter in her monastery. And so demands for the Pope to consecrate Russia continued to go on, and they even continued down to today, though they're more muted today. And, of course, the people were also demanding that the third secret be released and saying that it contained things like a nuclear war or an apostasy from the faith. All right. So after the 1984 entrustment, what happened next? Within a few years of the consecration, the Cold War wound down. Gorbachev, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, became the head of the Soviet Union in 1985, and he enacted new reforms called perestroika. Eastern Europe broke away, including Poland, broke away from the control of the Soviet Union in 1989. In 1990, six Soviet republics seceded from the USSR particularly the Baltic states. In 1991, the Soviet Union itself dissolved and was replaced by the Commonwealth of Independent States. And there were some guys up on the Russian space station at the time. And it, I remember when this happened, it was like around Christmas time. And they had gone up from the Soviet Union and they came back down to the Commonwealth of Independent States. Wow. <laughs> wow. So did John Paul II have anything to say relating to these events? Yeah, in his in the 1994 book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, he wrote, And what are we to say of the three children from Fatima who suddenly, on the eve of the outbreak of the October Revolution, heard, Russia will convert, and in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph? They could not have invented those predictions. They did not know enough about history or geography, much less the social movements and ideological developments. And nevertheless, it happened just as they had said. He went on to write, Perhaps this is also why the Pope was called from a faraway country. Perhaps this is why it was necessary for the assassination attempt to be made in St. Peter's Square, precisely on May 13, 1981, the anniversary of the first apparition at Fatima, so that all could become more transparent and comprehensible, so that the voice of God, which speaks in human history through the signs of the times, could be more easily heard and understood. The significance of these words would only be understood when the third part of the secret was revealed. Basically, in 1994, in the two passages you just read, he revealed the contents of the third part of the secret, but he phrased it in a way that wasn't obvious at the time. So how did the release of the third secret happen? In the year 2000, so that's six years after crossing the threshold of hope, John Paul II beatified Francisco and Jacinta Marto, two of the seers from Fatima, and he also decided that the time had come to release the third part of the secret, which the Holy See did in that document I mentioned titled The Message of Fatima. They published photostats of Sister Lucia's original handwritten pages in Portuguese, as well as translations. So what was this third secret? According to the message of Fatima, it said, After the two parts, which I have already explained, at the left of Our Lady and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand. Flashing, it gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire. But they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out, in a loud voice, penance, penance, penance. 
and we saw in an immense light that is God, something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it. A bishop dressed in white, we had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Other bishops, priests, men and women religious going up a steep mountain, at the top of which there was a big cross of rough-hewn trunks as of a cork tree with the bark, before reaching there the Holy Father passed through a big city, half in ruins and half trembling, with e halting step, afflicted with pain and sorrow. He prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees, at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him, and in the same way there died one after another the other bishops, priests, men and women religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross there were two angels, each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand, at, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs, and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. So they saw an angel with a flaming sword, whose fire threatened to consume the earth, but Our Lady stopped that from happening, and the angel cried, Penance, penance, penance. They saw a bishop which they in white, which they had the impression was the Pope. They saw him and others proceed through a ruined city and up a steep mountain, which had a cross at the top where he knelt. There he was killed by soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him, and others were killed with him. And then as the souls of the martyrs ascended to heaven, they were sprinkled with their blood by the two angels. I just want to remark that in the vision, it was as of a cork tree with the bark. Uh -huh. she, they would be, she would be, uh, the, the sister Lucy would be familiar with that because cork comes from Ireland, like the cork trees. That's where they harvest uh -huh. the cork bark. So, uh, not Ireland, I'm sorry, Portugal. I don't know Portugal. why I said Ireland. Portugal. Mm -hmm. Well, so, there is a cork in Ireland, yes. and there was a Marian apparition there. I think that must be my my brain was making that connection. But I meant to say Portugal, and that's where the cork comes from. So that I, it's interesting to see how uh, this contains some of her own impression from her natural humanness, like you were saying mm -hmm. before. So I just thought yeah. it was interesting. Also, I was going to mention, since we're on the details, I was going to mention the she mentions the angels had a crystal aspersorium mm -hmm. and people may not be familiar with that word. It's also called an aspergill. It's what you asperges is is Latin for like sprinkling. And that's what the priest does in the rite of blessing and sprinkling on certain days at mass. He's got the the container with the holy water and he dips the uh, aspergill or aspersorium in it and then sprinkles the people with the holy water. And so that's the image that's being drawn upon here. Presumably Lucia and the other children had seen that at mass. And then that became part of their vision here with the souls of the departed being sprinkled with the, with their own martyrs blood. Interesting. So it's a, it's a re remarkable vision. So mm -hmm. how did people react to this revelation of the third secret? It depends on the people. Uh, <laughs> skeptics of Fatima weren't impressed. Believers in Fatima, like me, were amazed. I was amazed when this yeah, happened. I had had a special devotion to Our Lady of Fatima for years. And to finally have this announced and learn what it was, it's like, wow, mm -hmm. uh, including for reasons we're going to talk about soon. Many, though, who had been demanding the release of the secret were aghast and started seeking ways to explain why the, the revealed text of the third secret didn't fit their ideas about it. Because there's nothing in there about the end of the world or an apostasy from the faith. And some of them had built careers and ministries on the idea that it did contain those things. And to have it suddenly announced that, nope, it's not in there, undermined years of work and effort that they had put in on demanding that the secret be announced. And it was going to say these things when, when it was announced and they were all going to be vindicated. And then, no, they're not vindicated. And it caused huge cognitive dissonance. And they started looking for a way to retain both their prior ideas and fit that with the new situation. And so the inference they drew was that's not the third secret, or at least that's not all of the third secret. OK, so where do we go from here in this discussion? In uh, preparing the outline for this episode, I realized there was too much to say for a single episode. So I had to split it in two. Next episode, we'll talk about the interpretation of the third secret and the different theories about it. But 
you won't have to wait long. I know the first one we had to wait from uh, May to October. We're not going to do that to you again. <laughs> we'll be releasing, <laughs> not even a week. Yeah. Uh, we'll be releasing episode 65 in just two days for uh, Sunday, October 13th, the 102nd anniversary of Our Lady of Fatima's last appearance to the children. And so just two days, we're releasing this on Friday. It'll be out on Sunday. You won't have to wait long. Your patience will be rewarded. So, uh, Jimmy, what further resources do we have to offer people that will uh, help tie them over until then? There are a number of books. Uh, one of them is by Archbishop Tarsicio Bertone. It also has a preface by Benedict XVI. It's called The Last Secret of Fatima. It deals with the release of the third secret. There's also a book by uh, Martins and Fox that I recommended back in episode 40 called Documents on Fatima, which is this massive book of primary source documents. It's really good. If you really want to deep dive on this, that book you want to get. It doesn't cover the third secret because it was released before the third secret was announced, but it, it covers all kinds of stuff leading up to that. Also, we have uh, Sister Lucia's Fatima in Lucia's Own Words, Volumes 1 and 2. Sister Lucia, after the third secret was released, also issued a book called Calls from the Message of Fatima. And uh, we'll have a link to Catherine, uh, to Sandra Zimdar Schwartz's book, Encountering Mary, which I've mentioned a few times. It's a very objective, scholarly look at different Marian apparitions, including Fatima. We'll have a link to The Message of Fatima, the document that the, the Holy See released in 2000. We'll also have a link to the 1978 Vatican document on discerning private revelations. We'll have a series of articles that I wrote about the Third Secret and Fatima more broadly. We'll have Wikipedia's article on Fatima, and also an article on the hijacking of the Aer Lingus flight in 1991. Uh, an article, 1981. Uh, we'll have an article on Mehmet Ali Aja, the assassin who tried to kill Pope John Paul II, and then we'll have a link to the assassination attempt itself. All right. So lots of reading for you to do, folks, over the next few days. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you, you can obviously uh, read those at your leisure. So yeah. let's, let's talk about our mysterious feedback this week. Uh, our feedback this time comes from our episode on aliens and religion. And Paul L. on Facebook wrote, this was a great episode, one of my favorites easily. Random question. What do you think of C.S. Lewis, Lewis's notion in his space trilogy that after the incarnation of Christ, all intelligent life would be human in appearance? I can't rule it out, but I also am not particularly persuaded by it. The, there, I, I see that kind of reasoning as another manifestation of a common human tendency to assume that everything revolves around us. So just like people originally assumed the whole universe revolves around us, we're at the special point, I think that kind of reasoning, so, oh, Jesus, God became one of us, therefore, that means all intelligent life is going to look like us in the future, I think it's a little humanocentric. And so I would, I would think just like, just like everything doesn't revolve around the place where humans live, physical forms for intelligent life or where God might choose to incarnate don't simply revolve around human life either. So I, I can't rule out God's omnipotent. He can do what he wants. So he could make them all look like us or he could make them all look different. And just because he incarnated here doesn't mean he didn't also incarnate elsewhere. OK, it's uh, up to him. So Rick writes on Facebook, uh, this episode made me laugh, especially the part about the application of the commandments. Also, you broke a podcast record for the use of the word or. Very entertaining and thought provoking. Yeah, embrace the power of or. That's <laughs> uh that's kind of that's sort of could be a slogan for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Or <laughs> so uh then the internet peasant writes on YouTube. Jimmy, if you or any of your listeners interested in this topic have time to read fiction, I highly recommend the book Eiffelheim by Michael Flynn. A priest philosopher in the 1300s, a time of great upheaval in Europe and the church, comes across some strange visitors in the woods outside his village, stranded and trying to get home. It's absolutely worth the read and intelligently delves into many of these types of questions and more. And I have to say, uh, when my wife, Melanie, read this, she said the exact same thing. The Eiffelheim uh -huh. is a great book for this. I, I've heard it highly recommended. I've read a little bit of the front of it, but I haven't finished it. But I have heard it highly praised by others. Yep. 
Uh, B.R. Omeliad one on YouTube writes, another interesting book about this subject is The Sparrow by Mary Doria Russell. It has Jesuits investigating a newly discovered alien race who sang music in which they interpreted as a hymn to God. Their actions led to a huge disaster from not understanding the major differences these aliens had from humans. Spoilers, there are two intelligent races on this new planet, and they have a predator-prey relationship where one subjugates the other. I have to say, I started reading The Sparrow years ago and never finished uh-huh. it. Uh, it wasn't my thing, but... Yeah, yeah. The Sparrow is the, a classic science fiction book about mm-hmm. God and, and alien races and stuff like that. It's very famous for being that. And uh, it's interesting. She's got an anticipation of the Kelpians and the Ba'ul there. Yes, from Star Trek Discovery. Uh, so BP26P writes on YouTube, the topic I asked for after listening to the Kenneth Arnold episode, uh, as in the, the aliens and religions one. Awesome. After a long day dealing with a death in the family, mistakes at work and drama among friends, this episode is a precious gift of respite. So sorry for the the troubles you're dealing with, but so glad that uh, that you liked the episode, and thank you for being one of the many people who suggested it. Yes. Uh, Caleb B. Uh, writes on Patreon, This is the episode I became a patron for, as I'm very interested in thinking about alien biology and culture and the possibilities of first contact. I'd recommend C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy for an interesting novel about unfallen aliens. Like Dom said a couple times during this episode, the two of you have given an aspiring Catholic novelist a few ideas. Awesome. That was one of our goals. <laughs> so, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? Well, the first link is to an article on new discussions about how humans arrived in the Americas. Uh, for years and years, we've heard about them coming over the land bridge that used to exist between Alaska and Siberia. But now there's some challenge to that, Mm. that they may have gotten here more directly. And so you you can read about that. Also related, we'll have a link to an article about stone tools that have been found that suggest the first Americans came from Japan. So we could maybe identify specifically where in the old world they came from. And then, speaking of our friends in Asia, you may have seen a news story recently announcing that the Chinese lunar rover that's up there right now, roving about the lunar surface, discovered a mysterious gel-like substance. And you may be going, how could there be gel in the frozen cold of the dark side of the moon? Hmm. And we should say the dark side of the moon is only called dark because it's turned away from us. It can it can get light there, too. Right. It's just always turned away from us because the moon is tidally locked to the earth. But how could there be this gel in this vacuum? And when it's cold for two weeks straight, it looks like there may be a mistranslation. (laughs) <laughs> and so Oops. <laughs> it, it wasn't actually gel they found it looks like it was something else and if you want to know what uh that probably was check out this article awesome so in a minute jimmy i'm going to ask you what our next episode is going to be about i think we all have an idea but i will ask you anyway <laughs> but first i want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible including ben and Susie s brian t uh jason w tim h and bill b Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So, Jimmy, what is our next episode going to be about? I admire your sense of (laughs) of, uh, the sake of form. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Um, It's going to be the third secret of Fatima part two theories. Mm, Okay. So that's it from us. Uh, If you'd like, you can send us feedback on this for first part before you get to the second part. Although I would suggest maybe wait to hear the both parts. But when you do, you can visit sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. Uh, be sure if you have not yet subscribed, if you're listening to this just off of the website or something, be sure to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, uh, iHeartRadio, I think we're on now. Uh, I think that's active by now. Your favorite podcast app. 
or on our YouTube channel, the SQPN YouTube channel, where you should make sure you hit the bell to get notifications. You'll find links to all of the resources Jimmy mentioned and links to those mysterious headlines in our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.